hey, I think I think I got it right this time on the going live. Hi, I'm Tom Merritt. Nate Langston from Wired.co.uk is going to join me on the show today. How's it Hi, going, yeah. Nate? Oh, I'm good. Yes, I'm. I'm I uh, I gave him the stories minutes in advance of the show. So minutes be... would be putting it nicely. It's more like minutes. <laughs> Seconds in advance of the show. Uh, but no, we got we got some good stuff because. Uh, we're going to talk about the the Pirate Bay thing, which I think everybody's fairly familiar with today. And you've been trying out 4K monitor, a 4K monitor with a Mac Pro, right? 4K monitor, Mac Pro, 4K gaming. It is it is exciting times to be Nate Langston. This right is now. this is still an experimental show, but I like this idea of the cold. This is our cold open tease, right? Mm -hmm. uh, That's it's a good like, name. did you ever see the uh, do you ever see the show Studio 60? No, I did not see that. It uh, it was it was is probably not a problem that you didn't, uh, but it was all about like a Saturday Night Live type of show, all uh -huh. told from behind the scenes. But I guess if we, we'd need to like turn the cameras in other directions or something. Anyway, yeah, I've only seen the opposite side of your broadcasting station once, I believe. I think when you had the another Lytro, what was it called? The, uh, uh, you know the. Uh, this name escapes me. It's almost as if this wasn't my job to know this sort of stuff. <laughs> what, um, you're just talking about my webcam? The... There was, yeah, you did it once, um, not that long ago. You know, the um, the, the touchless mouse thing. Oh, um, the, um, yeah, 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 no, I remember now. Um, this thing, glad, it's right yeah, there. I'm, I'm glad this is stumping you as well. This, this thing, right? Yes, that <laughs> thing there that has no name. That was the apparently... Leap Motion. It says on the back of it. Why couldn't either one of us think of that? Oh, that's I don't know. Psychologically, that's very interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's the only time I, I've I've seen the other side of of your of your studio. Right. Well, maybe we'll do a maybe we'll do a little short post show in the video version. But uh, we've got an audio show to record, so we should probably get to that. That sounds good. All right. Here we go. <laughs> This is the Daily Tech News for January 28th, 2014. I'm Tom Merritt. Joining me today, very happy to have Nate Langson, editor of Wired.co.uk, and I would like to thank friend of the show. Nate, may I say that? Ah, you absolutely can, can say that. It's a pleasure to be here, too. Hey, it's good to have you, man. Uh, I love talking with Nate. Uh, we've been technology friends for years. Yes. And... He's always got something interesting going on. We're going to talk to him about a road test of a 4K monitor with the Mac Pro later on. Yeah, 4K monitor, 4K gaming. The first time I think I've ever had the opportunity to get hands-on with 4K Ultra HD gaming. So very exciting times. All right, let's start, though, with some headlines. The Verge reports Google's Glass Explorer Edition, which features the ability to remove the glass hardware and use with prescription lenses, now has four different official Google frames to choose from, designed specifically to work with glass and accommodate corrective lenses. If you're lucky enough to be allowed to pay the $1,500 for the Google Glass Explorer Edition, then you now have the additional right to fork over an extra $225 for the frames in the Titanium Collection because they're made of titanium. Uh, if you are a member of the VSP health insurance group, though, VSP would like to cover a portion of the cost for its members, and they're even helping to train up top interests. Yeah, I'm still waiting for my Google Glass monocle. <laughs> At half the price, it'll only be $750. <laughs> Wired UK, hey, that's you, reports that the Dutch Court of Appeals in The Hague has overturned a ruling requiring ISPs Zigo and Excess for All to block the Pirate Bay. They overturned that block. The court found that the case law from the European Court of Justice holds an ISP should not be forced to take measures that are ineffective. And in the decision, they referred to two studies from the Institute for Information Law that showed no lasting effect on the levels of piracy of the block. Any piracy group, Brine, which brought the case, has been ordered to pay 326,000 euros in legal fees. Yep, more discussion coming soon, I think, on that one. 
Yeah, yeah, we're going to talk about that a little later. The Next Web reports Google today launched Chrome apps for Android and iOS. The development framework means an app can be coded in HTML, CSS, and JavaScript and then wrapped up in a shell that enables them to be distributed in the Google Play or Apple app stores. This builds on the Chrome app store launched in September for Windows, Mac, and, of course, Chrome OS. Also, Google made their virtual Lego tool, Build with Chrome, available to everyone who has a Chrome browser. So that's lots of building going. CNET reports Rovio, maker of the Angry Birds game, has been forced to state it, quote, does not share data, collaborate, or collude with any government spy agencies, end quote. According to documents leaked by Edward Snowden, the NSA has been collecting data from leaky ad networks in popular games like Angry Birds. Rovio did say it would reevaluate its relationship with third-party networks that might be used for spying purposes. Woohoo! CNET reports that despite what you may think, the internet is getting faster. A report from Akamai, the company that hosts most of the images and videos you see on the net, claims that in the 133 regions it tracks, average global connection speed rose to 3.6 megabits per second in Q3 of 2013. That's a 10% jump over Q2 2013 and a 29% jump over Q3 2012, year over year. Average peak connection speed did fall from Q2 by 5.2%, but it rose also year over year by 13%. And in a follow-up from yesterday, it's probably not too shocking to hear that The Verge reports Charlie Shrem has resigned from his position as vice chairman of the Bitcoin Foundation. Shrem was arrested yesterday on charges of providing a Bitcoin exchange for users of the now-closed Silk Road marketplace. AT&T seems to have survived the T-Mobile uncarrier onslaught nicely. CNET reports the telco posted Q4 profit of $6.9 billion on revenue of $33.2 billion and earnings per share of $0.53, cents, beating analysts' expectations of $0.50 cents a share and revenue of $33.1 billion. Also, Yahoo reported earnings, Q4 2013 revenues of $1.2 billion. That's down 2% year over year and earnings per share of $0.46. Cents. Full year 2013 revenue was $4.68 billion. That's down 6%. Analysts had been expecting revenues of $1.2 billion, which is pretty much what they got, and earnings per share of $0.38. Cents. So they got a little better on that. Looks like Marissa's buying spree uh, affected the earnings. Absolutely, yes. And now for some news from you. Galadiel passed along a Verge story about new voluntary guidelines for movie trailers. These guidelines were released by the National Association of Theater Owners. The guidelines ask that trailers run no more than two minutes. Stop spoiling the whole movie with five. Actually, they usually run about two and a half minutes, so it's 30 seconds shorter than usual. Guidelines also recommended against prompting viewers, viewers to go to a website or to type a code into their mobile device. Presumably, this is to stop people from pulling out their mobile device after they've just been asked to turn it off. Yeah, this, this is a really great story, but I can't help but think, why have we not got Vine movie trailers yet? Six seconds, like, just sum it up in six and get it out of the way. Webitube pointed us to a Kotaku report that Nintendo would start making mini-games for phones. The post was based on a report from Japan's Nikkei, referring to N Nintendo President Satoru Iwata's willingness to use the mobile platform but not so fast. Nintendo told Engadget, quote, there are no plans to offer mini-games on smartphone devices. Uh, Nikkei was just referring to Nintendo's willingness, in Nintendo's words, to make use of smart devices to promote products. So, something lost in translation. Yes. And Captain Kipper submitted a Boing Boing article pointing to a screenshot posted on Twitter by The Bakery LDN. Is that something in your neck of the woods, I would guess? Bakery London? So, uh, yeah, we, we have many bakeries here in London. Some of them burn down and cause citywide fires. Well, this is The Bakery LDN. Uh, they, they put a, a screenshot of what a company sees when you log into a website using Facebook. The control panel not only offers up the usual address, Gmail, gender fields, also activities, political views, photos, all those other quirky profile feeds. And hey, just to top it off, the company also gets access to your friends' Facebook data too and all their political views. Yay for sharing. Yay. 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 <laughs> That's a look at the headlines. All right. This episode is brought to you by you. Thanks to the folks at patreon.com slash ace detect. That's P A T R E O N dot com slash A C E D T E C T. We've almost got a thousand patrons at this point. 
uh, the the outpouring has been overwhelming. I'm at, I'm just asking folks if they can afford a nickel a show. That's a buck a month uh, to to subscribe. It's voluntary. You don't have to do it. There's plenty of other ways to support the show. But if you feel like you're getting a dollar a month worth of value out of the show, go to patreoncom detect and give a dollar back. Just make it value for value, as Adam Curry likes to say. All right, Nate, let's talk a little bit about this uh, this ruling in your backyard, so to speak, down there in the Netherlands. Uh, there have been several ISPs in a cat and mouse game with this company. Uh, is it Brine or Bine? I'm never 100% sure. That's a good question. <laughs> uh, but they are an anti-piracy group. Brine, yeah. I think. Uh, B-R-E-I-N, or maybe Brain. I don't know. They have been trying to fight the good fight of blocking the pirate base, saying that that's, it's illegal to go there. They have nothing but illegal things. You, you should block them, ISPs. ISPs have been taking the side of, look, blocking them doesn't do any good. It's it's just breaking the way the Internet is supposed to work. If you want to stop the pirate bay, there's lots of better ways to go about it. And in this case, uh, the Court of Appeals in The Hague ruled in the ISP's favor. Now, they ruled just for Zigo and Excess for all. The ruling will help out other ISPs like UPC, KPN, T-Mobile, and Tele2, who have all been in similar cases. And the court said, while a small group of respondents download less from illegal sources or claim to have stopped, and a small but significant effect is found on the distribution of Dutch peers, talking about BitTorrent peers, here's the important part from the study that the court was citing, no lasting net impact is found on the percentage of Dutch population downloading from illegal sources. Mm -hmm. And so the court said, forget it. It doesn't do any good. It's no reason to force someone to do it. Yeah, I mean, it, I suppose in a sense it's this classic case of whack-a-mole, which is the, you know, the, the metaphor rolled out, if you like, the analogy for, for how these systems work. And, and, and I sort of think that in a sense there are some people who maybe, you know, time poor, cash rich, um, who are off put by the blocks, uh, and then and that will push them towards legitimate sources because eventually it does save them time because sources now are more popular and we can get access to what we want when we want. It's not that expensive, um, but but by and large, I think that what we've seen time and time again is that when people put these blocks in place, all that happens is someone else goes to the next one that isn't blocked, or they use Google Cache, or they use the many sites that pop up with very similar sorts of names or different um, ex you know, domain extensions. Um, and it never really seems to do any, any good. Um, so, but I think it's one of these things where it, it's kind of like trademarks in a sense. So companies have to be seen to be enforcing their copyright. They have to be seen to be defending what they've got. And so if they're seen to just ignore all this and never act on it, then, then that doesn't look good either. Um, it, it makes it more difficult potentially for them to enforce these things in future. So it has to be done, but it's not a surprise that this court has made this decision. Yeah, it's not a legal principle that they need to be seen, but it's a practical principle uh, yeah. because, because common law or common behavior or common practice can start to emphasize that this is the acceptable way to do things. I thought what was really interesting in the two studies that this that the court cited from the Institute for Information Law. One of them was called Downloading from Illegal Sources in the Netherlands, and it did a survey. It said, where do you get your stuff? Do you buy a physical copy? Uh, do you, do you uh, stream it? Do you get it illegally, or do you pay to download it? Getting it illegally was actually the third most popular uh, behind buying it physically was still the most popular, uh, and then streaming it somehow was the second most popular. I, I was surprised at this because the study goes on to say that really the downloading illegally was almost entirely movies and music. That games, video games, and books didn't have much piracy at all. That people were, were much, uh, much more likely to pay even for the digital copies of stuff. If you had to guess, Nate, why do you think that would be? I don't know, but you know what? That's, that surprises me. It really, really surprises me because games, I, I mean, I, software is, is an interesting one, but games, I mean, for all of Steam's success, and there are some very popular um, ways of getting access to, to, to games out there, but I still think that um, my first port of call, if I wasn't going to Steam, would, I'm not sure what necessarily that would be. Um, whereas music is, there's loads of ways you can get it. I mean, you can you you would need every hand in this town just to count uh, on fingers how many sources you've got. So all the fingers, <laughs> all the fingers, yeah. So um, it, I'm not sure why that is. I mean, one thing that interests me is in in Japan. Um, 
they don't have Spotify, for example. You know, they don't have a lot of these services because buying CDs and physically owning stuff is still seen as the as the way to go. People there love to own a physical copy. CD singles sell in the in the millions. Um, it's it's crazy how how different that marketplace is to how ours is in the UK and and yours in, in the states, obviously. Um, and so it it does fascinate me how these trends differ so greatly from region to region and it's a cultural thing I'm convinced it's just a cultural thing um, but um, but it's difficult it's difficult to quantify that from from the comfort of my my armchair or my armless chair yeah so I'm, I'm looking a little closer at this and and they they did the survey in 2012 during May and June in the Netherlands so it's just the Netherlands uh, the number two for most of these things was the was the free streaming although it's also free downloading, but most of the free stuff is going to be streaming. So things like Spotify were definitely more popular than piracy still. Uh, but when it came to like, well, can I, can I pay to get it or should I just download it uh, through piracy? They, with music and movies, people preferred to just download it through piracy. Maybe it's because those were the early things that were more accessible. Uh, and, and, the, and so it's built up a pattern of behavior. Of course, the upshot well, it, of all of this is that the pirate bay getting blocked didn't didn't do anything to those numbers. Here's, here are my two cents. Now, this this is a uh, I have a personal reason for thinking this may be the case. The I don't use Spotify. I don't use any streaming services at all. I still buy CDs because I like a to feel like I own the music. Because I, there have been occasions where stuff that I've liked has just disappeared from Spotify. And I and and also the 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 quality the audio quality I'm a bit of a hi-fi nut um, as well so that's an important thing for me but I have to say if I was able to download files uh, from Spotify in the same way that I was able to stream them I'm not sure if I would feel the same way I mean it's not going to happen because labels don't want to let you feel like you own those you're simply renting those uh, that access and that, and that's fine I, I understand that um, but for me it's just about always feeling like I can control what I have. And be able to put it on any device I have. And although streaming services have got better in that regard, that they are platform agnostic, for the major ones certainly. Um, it's still a factor that stands between me buying uh, into a streaming service and still paying to buy CDs or downloading individual tracks from from Amazon or, or iTunes, which is what I tend to do for crappy pop songs and uh, and things like that. So, um, so I wonder if that might be it. Maybe people there just they still they're still carrying a lot of iPods. I'd be very interested to see how many people buy iPods uh, in the country because I still think that if you buy an iPod, maybe you still buy downloaded music or purchase music from CD because you, you can't purchase stream. yeah physical copies. That would make sense. Yeah, uh, I I am heartened though that a, a judge would say, look. If you have a reason to block a site, that's fine. But if, if there's really no effect, why block it? And I, and I know Brian's director, Tim Kuick, says, the court's ruling is detrimental to the development of a legal online market which requires protection against illegal competition. I don't disagree with him, but I think what the judge is saying is th this isn't doing any good. This is like telling the highway department, uh, you know, thieves sometimes drive on the road, so we need to put up roadblocks everywhere, and the thieves just drive around. Do you yeah. need to maintain those roadblocks? I know they're not very costly, but why have them at all? Well, I, I think it's because it's one of those things where you are basically, with every one of these blocks, um, you are adding another... Uh, sort of another percentage of laziness that you can that you can combat. So the really super determined people that are like, I am not going to pay for this. I'm going to download it legally. They will always find a way around, and there will always be a way around. Um, but maybe if you just block one site, no, it's ineffective and pointless. But if you block a hundred of the most popular sites, I can I can see that working for a lot of people and and just deterring them away from thinking that because they're wasting so much time just trying to find a uh, a source they can even get access to. I guess um, my only issue there is, can you really block it though? The Pirate Bay was the most popular source. They blocked it, but mm -hmm. you were still able to get get to the Pirate Bay, even from within the Netherlands. Like you can do, you can do this test though. I mean, Virgin Media, who is my ISP and and who I'm coming over now, and 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 it's it's great. It's super fast, and I like it. But it really does annoy me every time I hear about another site that's being blocked. Not that I'm using them, but you can test it. You can you could do a Google search for, you know, any band CD torrent, and you can try any of the top 20, 30, and they'll all say, this page blocked by Virgin Media, this page blocked. And I'm thinking sometimes, well, that probably would put off a lot of people um, from doing that, if that's what they wanted to do every single time. Um, 
So I don't know. It's I, got a long way to the go. Study, the studies, the studies here say otherwise, at least in the Netherlands. But uh, I, I think what you're saying makes sense, makes common sense. But yeah. maybe the people who are sophisticated enough to know I want to go find torrents are sophisticated enough to go find the alternate URL, or it yeah, just shows or, up in their search engine. Or just tether to a 4G connection and that tends yeah, to work. And you're out. Yeah. Uh, before we move on to our uh, messages of the day, I wanna I wanna talk about your 4K streaming setup. You you've been testing 4K monitor with a Mac Pro. I say streaming because we were just talking about all the streaming, <laughs> but it's 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 for doing video editing, but also you know playing some games too, right? Oh yes, I am. I'm very happy. So basically, I um I wanted to do a review um, of the Mac Pro, but I'm not a um you know I'm not a professional movie studio editor i'm not somebody who is going to milk this for all of its all of its worth so i wanted to think of some different angles um, and write a review kind of aimed at the enthusiast who maybe has you know a bit of extra cash um, so I, I i got a mac pro on loan from apple for a few weeks and i've been testing it out with video editing and 4k stuff and yeah that stuff's great it's super powerful and and, and lovely but I wanted to test it with 4K gaming because one of the things that I'm slightly disappointed about with the, um, I say next gen consoles, they're current gen now, aren't they? Right, the four, the the, the PS4 and the, and the Xbox One is that they're still 1080p, and there's been a lot of talk about how with the original Xbox 360 and the PS3, they were sort of the catalysts to HD um, really taking off in the home because finally people had a a way to get regular HD content onto the TV screens that they may or may not have just bought. I was slightly perturbed that there's no talk of 4K gaming yet, and so being having the Mac Pro here, I've been able to test what 4K gaming is like. And uh, Borderlands 2, it turns out, runs at 4K. So I got one of the 4K monitors from Shop, um, hooked it up, fired up all the settings to max, and it it plays. It plays. It's not an amazing frame rate. It's around if you ramp all the settings to absolute maximum, and you're in 4K, it runs a sort of about 20, 25 frames a second, drop those settings down to maybe just about medium or just over medium, and you're hitting sort of 30, 40, 50 frames a second, um, you know, and it looks good. And that is pretty impressive, um, seeing a game, a, a very, you know, still pretty recent game being rendered at, at high settings in real time in front of you in a cinema sort of resolution. It's, it's been pretty good. And it's a Mac Pro, so it's not like it's an underpowered machine, right? Like, this is a pretty fair test, even though the Mac Pro may not be designed for gaming, per se. But that's kind of why I wanted to test it. So um, when, I, when I got this model, I asked for the entry-level model, the, 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 the model that somebody who maybe thought, I really want a Mac, and I'm really interested in doing some gaming, because obviously you can put Boot Camp on here, too, and, mm. and run Windows and, uh, and what have you. And I thought, if, if someone like that was going to buy a Mac Pro for gaming, they're not probably going to buy the tricked-out top model because it's just thousands and thousands of pounds or dollars. So this is kind of the, the entry level model that I that I've been using and it's it's pretty it's okay for, for 4K gaming. It's really interesting. But the weird thing is is that this is has so much more power even than the games consoles right now. But this isn't isn't probably good enough for a console like experience, which makes me question whether or not we will see in any any sort of the near future 4K gaming on the PS4 and the Xbox One. Um, They're both capable I, of it, right? They just haven't enabled it. Technically, yes. Yeah. It's just that when looking at the resolution on the Mac Pro with the with the it's you know it's twin GPUs, it's you know crazy high end ATI uh, AMD, sorry, um, uh, GPUs that are in there. 16 gig of RAM, all this stuff. The specs of this machine are higher than the consoles are, yeah. and it will run it at 4K, but you have to turn the settings down on this entry-level model uh, to about medium to get a really good uh, frame rate. Um, and although it will run it at that higher frame rate, you're kind of thinking, ah, oh, yeah, it's good, but it's not quite there. So on the consoles, which, which are lower powered still than the Mac Pro, it makes me wonder if they will actually even be powerful enough to run... Uh, the kind of games that we're seeing just coming out in 1080p now, because even the Xbox uh, One isn't running some games at 1080 still. It's it's a bit below. Yeah, it's an accident of timing, right? I mean, if you remember, yeah. HDTVs were were starting to to really become not affordable, but at least attainable in 2004, and that's right on the heels of the introduction of the PS3 and the Nintendo Revolution, uh, which became the Wii and and the Xbox yeah. 360. So there was perfect timing, right? Uh, yeah. This is the the opposite. The 4K TVs now just becoming attainable 
but the the new console generation is already out. It so. is, but 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 you know this generation is 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 going to be here for a decade minimum. Um, and if you look at games that we saw on the you know when the Xbox when the 360 came out um, or the PS3, and you look at something like The Last of Us, I mean they are. They are a generation of consoles apart. You know, some of the games on the PS4 don't look that much better, really, than than The Last of Us is on on the PS3. So there's still there's still room for this crazy level of optimization that these consoles are capable of, of facilitating sure. um, in gaming. But f- as a side by side test with Borderlands 2, it's you know a year old or, or whatever now, um, on on a cutting edge desktop machine, and it can do it, but it's not quite a console like experience. I have to think there's going to have to be a lot of optimi- optimization in these consoles if they're ever going to be able to do 4K adequately. Um, so yeah, that's that's my early days. Couple of couple of days at testing at 4K gaming so far, but um, it's it's still exciting. So good stuff, man. Uh, thanks yeah. for sharing your road test with us. Appreciate that. No, my pleasure. I'll have a write up on the site, of course, uh, on Wired at some point in the next. Wired.co.uk. Uh, real quick look at the calendar. Facebook and Qualcomm will have their earnings reports tomorrow. That's January 29th. Some messages of the day from you guys. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Uh, Jacob Leb wanted to provide some feedback on the conversation about payment solutions. Jacob is the director of IT for a chain of computer retail stores and deals with issues of fraud and this kind of stuff all the time. He says the check processing world has a mechanism for fighting fraud that has been in use for years. We've used it for the past decade. Sometimes it is called positive pay, but that is probably a trademark name. A simple idea is that when you write a check, you have to go to the bank's website and activate the check number with the exact amount authorized. There's also an API to use when you generate many checks. A similar process could be added to the credit card payment system in which a customer has to approve the charge and amount from a smartphone app. Most credit cards already provide an app that could be leveraged for this. Google Wallet is also in an excellent position to provide that level of security with the physical card they have and the NFC payment solution they offer. Hey, thanks, Jacob, for a little insight into that. I, I didn't know that that was a check processing mechanism inside retail, and it could totally translate. We're, we've been talk, kicking around the idea of, like, what if you combine coin with, with an online account like, a, like Orange used to have or T-Mobile is now launching here in the United States? Yeah, and I, the, the whole concept of, of um, physical cards and NFC and, and, and contactless payment just absolutely fascinates me at the moment because there's so much innovation going on there. Also, a, uh, a Twitter post from Dr. Carl at Robstack on Twitter uh, saying, smart things with if, uh, if this then that, is both powerful and decentralized. I can use my pebble to turn on my lights. He was responding to Gil Cabrera's rant about, I just want the one platform to do this. Gil did respond. He's like, yeah, it's, uh, if is pretty cool with smart things. So some home automation banter happening out there on Twitter if you follow those guys. Also, James wrote in, now he wrote in a very lengthy rant. I'm going to excerpt some things from it. Uh, Apologies, James. But he said, I've worked in industrial and commercial building automation for the last 13 years, and it's crazy to me how help in this market is hell-bent on recreating a wheel that already rolls very well. We need systems in the home, like the systems that I have available to me in commercial, scaled down, of course, that allowed for plug-and-play implementation of devices across several protocols into one seamless system. He's saying, I've already got this. Just scale it down to the house. All of the major players in my field have been there and done that. It just baffles me that no one in the home market wants to take what we have developed in commercial and industrial and repackage it for the home. The scale is obviously very different, but the technology to blend devices across protocols has been around for 15 to 20 years. For the home market players to ignore that is both greedy and foolish, he says. Wow. Yeah, so I know. This, is this 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 home this is this home automation stuff, right? Yeah, he said we were we've been talking a lot about the idea of of you know Google buying Nest and and what does that mean for the Internet right. of Things and home automation and there's 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 the smart home and home automation and they're kind of overlap but they're different things and I think what James is saying is I work in an industry and I look and I hear you saying like why doesn't somebody do this and I'm like they're already doing it in my industry but maybe his industry doesn't want to go into the home market and they may have patents and things that get in the way of somebody like Google or Nest or now Google Nest. Uh, trying to use those sorts of situations. 
Right. I do I do envisage a home of the future that's a little bit like Amazon's picking and packing systems where nothing you don't have all the DVDs in one place and all the books in one place. You just have shelves and shelves and shelves with everything on it. So you walk into a bathroom and you'll see, you know, a pillow, uh, you know, you'll see a cushion, you'll see uh, ketchup, you'll see all this stuff. <laughs> and it's just brought to you from wherever is most efficient and you'll robots. just sit in a corner, you know. I could yeah. I could see that. James is like, yes, exactly. That's how my warehouse is managed. I mean, I want my house to be managed that way. That's interesting <laughs> thought of like, you know, what is it that stops this industry, which is mature, from being translated directly? If anybody has insights into that, I'm sure there's good reasons. Give us, give us a shout. Feedback at Daily Tech. Oh, Show. Sorry, I'm interrupting, aren't I? No, yeah. that's all right. Um, I, I'm guessing it's it's retrofitting houses. Um, you know, when uh, warehouses and things are built for purpose, a house. Uh, tends to be quite old. My house is about 200 years old, so um, it's a little difficult, I think, to fit some stuff in. Shoot, my country is barely 200 years old. Your house is ancient. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. Uh, and finally, we've got this voicemail message from Rowan. Well, it's actually it seems to be from Rowan's MacBook Pro rather than actually from Dear Rowan. Dear Tom and my fellow esteemed DTNS hoi polloi. It's a shame that we have been programmed to consider a company with sales of $57 million U.S. and profit of $13 million U.S. a quarter a disappointment. I would agree with the market if my maker, Apple, made a loss, or for that matter profits which were below the market sector. But we don't. That's Long term creepy. we at Apple need to innovate and explore new markets to grow, which we are doing. That aside, my makers Apple have one thing going for them and that is brand recognition and trust. Apple has given better growth over the last 10 years than any other manufacturing companies for its long-term investors. Unfortunately it seems that we have become a disappointment for the very short-term speculators who are now swaying the market by their rhetoric. I wish the speculators and short-term investors would get away from the what's-in-it-for-me-today mentality and build themselves an equally strong long-term investment business like Apple. But alas I know better, and unfortunately that's not how the global stock market works. Cheers and a spiffing sparkling toast to you all my dear, well-informed wise TTNS listeners. Rowan's MacBook Pro doesn't Rowan's MacBook Pro have a snappier name than Rowan's MacBook Pro? And of course, of course, Rowan's MacBook Pro thinks that Apple is being undervalued by the market because Rowan's MacBook Pro is an Apple product. Yeah, it's biased, don't you think? Yeah, that's 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 a really creepy message as well. I sort of started getting <laughs> sucked into thinking it was the thought of a laptop. Well, that's the actual text-to-speech voice from a MacBook Pro, right there. I know, right? That's why. That's why it's so weird. <laughs> Not quite Siri-like yet. Uh, no, I suppose yeah. not. But it, it is the typical and, 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 and defensible reaction of like, hey, Apple thinks long-term, the market thinks short-term. And so the market turning against Apple is always going to be a short-term problem because in the, in the long-term, Apple wins. People really were getting behind that in the Steve Jobs era. It's been shaken a little recently because we haven't seen Apple come out with an iPad or an iPhone recently. Um, and and so when when their when their numbers are just good and not amazing, people say, well, what else have you done? That's it's the short term thinking of the market, though. That's what happens. Yeah. Well, hey, that's the end of our show. Thank you, Nate Langson, for joining us. Of course, we mentioned Wired.co.uk. Got uh, your test with the uh, 4K monitor coming out there. Anything else uh, going up that you want to let folks know about? Yeah, well, I suppose it's, it's the standard answer to that question, which is go and listen to the Wired UK podcast. Um, I've heard it's fantastic. Um, there's a guy who hosts it who sounds uh, remarkably like me, um, but we do that we do that every week. Um, you can find it on iTunes and, and those sorts of places. And we uh, we we sort of uh, we try and do a little bit of what you do, but on a, on a weekly basis, we pick the week stories from tech and science and business and weird stuff, um, and we we discuss those um, once a week. So that would be my main plug, I think. Absolutely. Check it out. Wired.co.uk. You folks like podcasts. There's a good one right there. Don't forget, you can have a voice in what stories we cover at our subreddit, dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. You can email us. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow. Give us a call. Leave us a voicemail, 512-59-DAILY. That's 512-593-2459. And visit our website, dailytechnewsshow.com. 
Com. If the weather allows, John Strickland will be our guest tomorrow. Here's hoping the internet's back in Atlanta. We'll see you then. And that's the show. Excellent. Good stuff, man. I really like that road test. Uh, just hearing you talk about you know putting the thing through its paces and everything, and it makes me really want to go read the story now. Once once you've got it up, to get all the details. Great, awesome. I thought I was I was rambling um, about halfway through, so uh, I'm glad you <laughs> I'm glad I'm glad you enjoyed it. Yeah, I mean it's just it's just such a new it's a bit of new territory, you know. I mean I don't normally review stuff uh, on the on the desktop side this high end, um, and so it's been a lot of fun to 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 really sort of get stuck into this and with 4K monitors and there's some really weird really weird stuff I don't know if anyone has done this test like I'm doing it cuz when I um I called up Sharp one of their PR people and said hey can I borrow a monitor for a couple of weeks to do this this review with and they were like yeah yeah that's, that, that's probably fine no one's no one's asked for for one yet so we'll have to see and I'm thinking what really no one has asked you to borrow one of the only two monitors available yeah and, it baffled me. So all these reviews of 4K and, and all this stuff, unless they've already got one or bought one, then no one has asked the company to to loan one for the review, which is you know what you would normally expect. So yeah, um, hopefully my my piece will have some pretty new um, thoughts in it as a result. Cool, man. That's a it's a great idea. I love that. Well, we're gonna uh, stop the broadcast now. So uh, say goodbye to the peoples of the world. Goodbye, peoples of the world. Thank you for putting up with me for 35 minutes. It was a pleasure. We'll see you later, folks. <laughs>